firefighter was sitting in the break room at the station. First day back on shift. His mom was in the nursing home. His dad struggles at home. One of his kids are homesick. The other has a game tonight. Suddenly, a call comes through. Firefighters jump in to turn out gear and engine 461 rushes out of the station to the destination of the fire. How do you give care if you also are in the position of needing care? I mentioned in my first blog that the four points or tongues of the Maltese cross stand for faith, justice, temperance, and fortitude, which I defined as courage. Well, sometimes faith can be described as belief. But take belief down one more level and you have trust. Trust can be hard to give. It can also be hard to uphold when someone else is placing trust in you. As someone who has suffered the loss of a child, I understand the need to care for yourself before being able to give heartfelt care for others. The question that I've had to face is, how much time off is enough time off. Unlike some may perceive, there are not those who have no needs and therefore they give care to others who are needy. And then there's those who are needy who can only receive care. The need for care and the ability to give care is actually on a bit of a sliding scale. There are many different types of care needed and certainly everyone has something that can be contributed. For those who make giving care their life's work, working and being in need are often simultaneous activity. Working as a chaplain with the fire and EMS professionals, I see many different coping styles. These people face the challenge of giving care every day and often do so while their loved ones are dying or their health is taking a hit or their relationships are in disarray? What is the secret for caregivers, whatever the career type, to keep functioning while in this impaired state? The answer is found only after understanding, first of all, if you are right now able to stay in service. Physically, that's a little bit easier to understand whether or not you can perform the necessary tasks physically is far more clear than it is as to whether or not you can perform them emotionally and mentally. The mind and the emotional state affecting the mind also have the ability to greatly impair physical function. This is no news to any of us when assessing the negative results of those who fail in this self-assessment. For this reason, it's imperative that we understand we are a team and function as such. The Bible, which is my field, has language for this. It says that value is brought to individuals as each relates to the team. It uses the language of a physical body. It says, do, no, do you not know that you are all a part of one body, being made up of many parts? which each of us hold in our unique skills and perceptions. Without this kind of function in an ambulance squad or a firefighting crew, patients would have far less chance for survival. The group wins or the group fails. And when they fail, when we fail, people die. This is why it's so important to understand several progressive steps after, after you've decided that you are whole enough to be able to save someone else. Several progressives, progressive pieces must be in place for you to continue on mission when you realize something is not okay with you, and yet you are going to continue. First, you must release, at least temporarily, to someone else the problem that's weighing on you. And by release, I don't mean advocate or ignoring the problem. Whether physical, mental, or relational, an ignored problem will grow below the surface and then suddenly rear its ugly head to upend you. When you release you, 
have had a conversation or an agreement with someone to be attentive to that need for now. It may be a spouse, a friend, a relative, or maybe your doctor. Just like you could not leave your puppy home on your couch all day without him eating it, you can't leave some problems uncared for or they will eat you. As we retrace the needed steps to function wholly, you must have also reached the step of finding someone who's competent. The need for competence goes beyond the medical and rescue fields, babysitters, mechanics, counselors, confidants, friends, must all be competent in order to be helpful. Often we may say, that's the last time I trust someone else to do that job. The problem is, this leaves only you to do every job, which is not helpful either. Many times the failure of the one we gave a task to is more about our poor choice of them than about their failure. We set them up to fail, and we set ourselves up to be disappointed. I guess sometimes the other extreme of carrying everything ourselves is being so desperate to get something off of our shoulders that we just give it to any warm, breathing body who won't say no. Before you can delegate an important task to someone, you must be able to trust them. Trust can be a very difficult thing to give. When you entrust someone with the care of your child, you are saying, I want them to do as good of a job caring for my child as I would do. When you leave your child with a teacher, you may even say, I want them to do a better job than I would do at teaching them. The same is true with your mechanic, your doctor. Well, you get the point. The problem is, when you have been let down by your mechanic or someone else, you may develop a mistrust for mechanics. Get the idea? That's kind of unfair. This brings up my spiritual topic. Can I trust God? If you've ever wondered the answer to that question, then you can join me and the large and time-tested group of people who have asked the same question. I could tell you a number of people in the Bible who wondered about trusting God. Abraham wondered if he was going to have to follow through when God had told him to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. He ended up not having to, but he had to be ready to. God provided a ram in the thicket nearby. It was just a test. In the New Testament, though, John the Baptist was arrested for proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and while John the Baptist was in prison, Jesus sent a message to him to let him know that the things that he had been proclaiming were coming about. He says in Matthew eleven five, The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Then he says something that can be very disheartening or helpful for us, depending on how we take it. He says, Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Wow. You know how John ended up? He ended up beheaded by the king. That doesn't seem like the way things should go for the guy doing a good job telling about Christ. Many of us have struggled with testing and with trusting God as he tests us. The reason we struggle with Trusting God is not because of God's reliability, though. It is because of our expectations. Unlike how we trust people to do things they can't do or fail to do, this is not why things don't turn out the way we wanted when trusting God. He is not unreliable or unworthy to take our cares. But here comes the trust issue. To trust God, we must also reserve judgment. We have to accept that He loves us and does want the best. I would have to say the place I'm at right now is I'm not sure He wants the best for me, but I do believe that He wants the best for His plan. And I have to trust 
that his plan will end up being the best for his people, which I am one of them. You don't always feel like you can trust people because people have let you down. And you don't always feel like you can trust God because he doesn't hold up the side of the bargain that we gave him. He operates from a bigger perspective than you or I hold. But he does always trust you and me. The amazing thing is that God's trust for us with the tasks that he's given us is, is steadily on us. He trusts us. That's a different twist on things. Think of it. Parenting, training, teaching other people's kids, caring for patients, or even saving people's lives has been entrusted to those of us who will enter into those caregiving roles. I notice that something seems to happen as God trusts me. As he, as I realize that he's trusting me, he doesn't save me from the tasks I would want him to save me from, but he expects me to enter into those with faith that I can do it through his strength. His trust makes me do beyond what I thought I could do. I'm walking in that every day. What I'm working on right now is to have faith in others. Some people we trust, they just let us down, but others come up to the level of trust or the faith that we've put in them. Therein is the challenge that takes real character. Can you have faith in someone else that causes them to rise up and believe in themselves? Some might say this is wrong-headed. We need to have faith in God. But what if, while you're having faith in God, God's having faith in you? So, we must have faith in ourselves as well. Only when we have faith in ourselves can we meet the daily alarms that call us to rush out to save others. We do what we can do. God does what he does. Figuring those things out, that's not for me, but that's for him.